On December 24th, 1968, Apollo 8 made its first orbit around the moon. While the astronauts were coming around the backside of the moon, one of the astronauts, Bill Anders, had taken out his Hasselblad camera to get a picture of the lunar landscape. As he pulled his hands up to take the photo, he saw the Earth in a way that, at the time, only those men had ever seen it. As a ball in the darkness of space. And he took possibly the most influential photo of all time. The photo now known as Earthrise. Earthrise can be described as many things. Influential, important, recognizable. But I would describe it as something different. To me, and to many others, this image, this famous influential image, can only be described as terrifying. The blackness of space around the Earth the visible meteorite craters in the moon, the simple fact that that tiny ball surrounded by the eternity of the cosmos is all of us, are just some of what makes this image absolutely petrifying to me. The fear I feel about this image, and images like it, is a fear that I'm not alone in. This fear of space has often been referred to as astrophobia. Astrophobia is the fear of space and the celestial bodies that inhabit it. I've covered other fears on this channel, but unlike those other videos, I can confidently say that I have astrophobia. Looking into the void of deep space, or an image of a gas giant several magnitudes larger than Earth surrounded by a pitch black void, these things are horrifying to me. And I'm clearly not alone. With videos on astrophobia getting millions of views, and us knowing more and more about the cosmos every year, this fear of space is something that many people can relate to, but why? Why is space so terrifying to so many people? Well, let's start off with one of the biggest triggers for astrophobia, at least for mine, planets. The planets in our Milky Way and beyond are creepy. They have an almost unsettling tinge to them. Seeing images on the surface of Venus or Mars is oddly unsettling. It feels like the uncanny valley Mars especially resembles Earth when seen from the ground, but you can always tell that this isn't Earth. This isn't home. But for me at least, the scariest part of these planets isn't their surfaces. What I find most uncanny about these planets is seeing them from space. I think it has something to do with the size and the planet's buildup, but what I find more scary is the darkness they exist in. This horrible darkness that makes the true size of the planet unrecognizable but you know they're still massive. They look almost like a face peering out of a dark closet, ready to jump at you. The two planets I find the scariest are Jupiter and Saturn. The fact that these planets, despite their large size, don't even technically have surfaces is just one of the details that unsettles me about them. The fact that you could simply fall right through them, and the fact that both of these planets are made of heavy, toxic gases, is truly unsettling to me. As a kid, I used to have nightmares about falling into Jupiter or Saturn. Just knowing that I couldn't breathe in there, and even if I could, the pressure and the toxicity of the atmosphere would most definitely kill me, was something I found terrifying and still do. Planets like Neptune and Uranus are also scary in their own right. The deep blue contrasts heavily with the blackness of space, and Neptune to me is especially scary considering it's the farthest from Earth making it feel even more alien. You might have seen maps of the solar system in school that look like this. These maps are good at showing the sizes, but inaccurate when it comes to distance. We tend to group the gas giants together as if they were some sort of system of their own, close by to each other, similar to the distances between Earth and Mars, but that couldn't be further from the truth. This is an actual two-scale model of the distances between planets. As you can see, Neptune is nearly double the distance that Uranus is from Saturn. Despite that, we tend to group Uranus and Neptune together as the icy, blue, cold planets. These vast distances aren't the only thing that scare me, however. Another thing that really gets me and freaks me out about these planets is their sheer size. Astromegalophobia is the fear of large objects in space. It's another thing that really freaks me out about these planets. Look at Jupiter, for example. The big red spot you can see in most photos of Jupiter is actually a storm that's been raging on for nearly 350 years, and a storm that is nearly twice the size of Earth. The sheer size of all these planets scares me. They seem almost menacing, 
something so inconceivably large that if I was standing in front of it, I would barely see past the base. Just knowing that these celestial bodies are out there somewhere, made up of gases that would kill me if I were ever to fall in them, makes looking at images like these, or even imagining myself standing out there in space in front of these gas giants, terrifying to think about. Looking at these images almost makes me feel like something is staring back at me. They're intimidating. But it isn't only the huge planets that scare me. In fact, I'd argue that tininess is even more scary. And that's what we are. Tiny. This is Earth as viewed from Saturn, taken by the Cassini Space Telescope. That's us. That's all of us. Every memory you've ever had, every human that has ever existed, every feud between countries, all of human history, and everyone you love or have ever heard about anywhere has all been here. It's no wonder then that people say we should send politicians to space so they can see the Earth as it is, an extraordinarily tiny ball in the middle of nowhere. Many astronauts, in fact, report their outlook on life changing after seeing Earth as such a small, fragile sphere, especially those on the Apollo missions. One of the Apollo astronauts, Edgar Mitchell, has a quote relating to this that I really like. From out there on the moon, international politics looks so... petty. I will never know the feeling of looking at Earth as a tiny ball in space, but looking at these images is the second closest thing to that. It really emphasizes how tiny we are. And a result of just how small we are is also our fragility. Space is hostile. We can be hit by a gamma ray burst or a rogue asteroid could come in our direction and we couldn't do anything about it. I think that concept alone contributes greatly to my astrophobia. We are simply at the mercy of the cosmos. The size of the universe is vast, of course, but it isn't just the solar system and the planets in it that scare me. There are many exoplanets that we've discovered that I'd argue are even scarier. Like the exoplanet Gliese 436b. It's a planet around the size of Neptune. Its surface is covered in ice, yet it orbits only 2.5 million miles away from its host star. Now, that might sound like a lot, but for reference, the closest planet to the Sun, Mercury, is nearly 36 million miles from the Sun. Its surface temperature is 882 degrees Fahrenheit, and yet it's still made completely out of ice. It's due to this phenomenon that the ice in Gliese 436b is constantly on fire. Yes, you heard that right, literal burning ice. The reason the ice doesn't melt is because of the immense gravitational pull from the planet's core, which prevents the water from evaporating away from the ice. And this burning ice isn't even the weirdest part of the exoplanet. Because of its high concentration of hydrogen, we would expect to see significant levels of methane in the atmosphere of Gliese 436b. But paradoxically, we see that the planet has 7,000 times less methane than it should, and has a significant amount of carbon monoxide instead. It's a planet with burning ice and poisonous air. Not scary at all. Another exoplanet that triggers my astrophobia, but more specifically my astromegalophobia, is the planet J1407b. They really need to give these planets better names. Saturn is to me the scariest planet in the solar system because of its rings. But Saturn has nothing on J1407b. For reference, this is Saturn. And this is J1407b. This exoplanet is hauntingly scary for me. First of all, the planet itself is nearly 10 times the size of Jupiter, which is scary enough, but the rings are what really get me about this exoplanet. They are 150 million kilometers across one side to the other. For some reference on how gargantuan that is, that is the distance between the Earth and the Sun. I can only imagine how terrifying floating next to the planet's rings would be. Seeing how far they go out, the fact that something like this is even allowed to exist, the fact that space can make these huge things is terrifying. But what's even more scary is the thought that this can go even further. After all, we can only see our observable universe. And even then, the farthest exoplanet we've ever observed is 27,000 light years away. The observable universe is about 94 billion light years across. And that's only the part that we can observe. There are probably billions, if not trillions, of other exoplanets that we haven't discovered yet with even more mind-bendingly scary properties. But we'll never know what those properties are. 
We will never research, find out, or understand trillions of exoplanets simply because of the size of the universe. But even in our small scope of exoplanets, we still see terrifying things, like the exoplanet HD 189733b, a planet with wind speeds incomparably faster than the ones on Earth, and a planet that rains literal glass at high speeds. It doesn't even need to be an exoplanet. Uranus and Neptune rain literal diamonds. The planets in our universe are a big contributor to my astrophobia, from the biggest to the weirdest to the most hostile. But when it comes to weird things in our universe, planets simply cannot compete with the fear that I feel for black holes. Melanoheliophobia is the fear of black holes. I definitely have this fear, there is no doubt in my mind. The thought of falling into a black hole is something that, at least to me, is one of the most horrifying things I can think of. On top of that, the sheer size that some of these black holes can get to is crazy, and plays into my fear of them. This is Tun 618, the largest black hole we have ever observed. This monster is 66 billion, yes billion with a B, times larger than our own sun. Remember all that talk at the start of the video about how big the solar system is? Even beyond Neptune, the Oort cloud of asteroids still stretches much farther than the planets. So it's surprising to find out that 11 solar systems can fit side by side inside of Tun 618. I don't care if you don't have astrophobia or megalophobia, but that is still a terrifying thought. But the appearances of black holes especially really gets me. The way they're just a menacing point of darkness, being massive enough to consume solar systems if they really wanted to. All of this combined makes black holes insanely terrifying and intimidating to me. But it isn't only their appearance. Black holes are the scariest object in the universe mostly because they're just so confusing. We know close to nothing about them, not even light, the fastest thing in the universe, can escape their pull. They're so fascinating, yet so horrifying. They have a menacing aura to them, along with how mysterious they are. Another thing that I think contributes to the fear of black holes, and really the fear of gas giants like Jupiter as well, is that there isn't a surface. Nothing to stand on. Just a void. Something that scares me even more than that is what happens when you fall into a black hole. If you fell into a regular black hole, you would die almost instantly. However, if you fell into a supermassive black hole, you wouldn't die at first. You would, instead, fall into eternal darkness for a few hours, and then die. But as this happens, due to time dilation, time gets so warped when you're in a black hole, the entire life cycle of the universe goes by while you fall. This happens for several complicated reasons that would be way too long to talk about here, but just that concept. Everyone you love, humanity, nay, reality itself, would be gone in a matter of hours. You would travel to the end of the universe and never come back. Knowing all of this, it baffles me how more people aren't scared of space. It's not just the celestial bodies in the universe either, it's the universe itself. The size of it is mind-boggling, and the formations of celestial bodies that can come from it is even more so. Seeing things like galaxies, these gigantic buildups of billions of stars, with the Milky Way alone having 100 billion stars, they are so huge that it takes light between 100 to 300,000 years to get from one side to the other on an average galaxy. But even average sized galaxies are behemoths in space, containing tens of billions of stars. Clearly, galaxies are huge, and that's what you would think. But of course, like most things being compared to the size of the universe, galaxies are nothing. Look at this image. Aside from these two single stars, every speck, smear, and tiny bit of light that you can see in this image is an individual galaxy. Every single piece of light that you see in this image, from the largest to the smallest, is an individual world harboring billions of stars and near trillions of planets with all types of weird properties and possibly even life. However, they're just so far away from us that we would never know. We would never know if there were life on any of these planets or what strange properties they have. We can't look at all of these planets. 
We can't see all of their stars, or be amazed at each individual black hole at their centers. The farthest man-made thing, the farthest signal that we as a species exist, Voyager 1, hasn't even left our solar system yet, and won't do so for between 14 to 28,000 years. NASA has a really cool section of their website dedicated to seeing exactly where Voyager 1 is right now and exactly how fast it's moving. It's a neat little webpage and it lets you know how truly small we are in the face of even our own solar system. And to think, our solar system only makes up an extremely small fraction of our galaxy. Just knowing that, knowing the true scale of galaxies, and then viewing an image like this one, really puts new emphasis on our place in the universe. But of course, this isn't the limit. Our galaxy exists in what's called the local group, with the Andromeda galaxy and many other dwarf galaxies. This local group is 10 million light years across. However, compared to other formations, galaxy groups are nothing. Let's look back at the galaxy image. The galaxy image and images like it only make up a small percentage of formations known as galaxy superclusters. We are currently inside of the Virgo supercluster, a gargantuan formation of galaxies that is 110 million light years across. Look at this image for a second. Every single dot in this image of the Virgo supercluster is an individual galaxy. If we choose to zoom out further, we would see the Laniakea supercluster. The Virgo supercluster is only a small, tiny fraction of what makes up the Laniakea supercluster. Just like entire galaxies in the Virgo supercluster, the Virgo supercluster is a mere smear inside of the gargantuan Laniakea supercluster. But of course, we're still not done. The Laniakea supercluster is yet another unimportant piece of the titanic puzzle that is the universe. Big thing after big thing turns small when comparing it to the scale of the thing above it. The observable universe itself contains 10 million superclusters just like Laniakea, with hundreds of thousands of galaxies in each one. Now I ask you once again to look at this image. These are all galaxies, vast galaxies, expanses we can never escape and places we can never reach, and yet are reduced to cosmic jokes when looking at the observable universe. And that's just the observable universe. We don't know the size of the actual universe, but for all we know, it could be infinite. This fear of just how large the universe is falls more into astromegalophobia than it does astrophobia. But astrophobia still plays a large role in my fear of the expansiveness of the universe. It's huge, sure, but we have no clue what could be hiding inside of it, and because of that, it triggers my astrophobia significantly. And despite the fact that we can only see a small amount of what there is to see, we have found so many weird things in the tiny fraction of the observable universe we can see. Weird exoplanets, black holes, galaxies, and yet, if we are to believe that the universe is much bigger than just the part we can observe, then what could be out there? What could be lurking in the places that we can't see? This thought alone is one that's terrifying and brings a lot of questions. What we know is out there is already scary enough, but not knowing what is truly out there is to me even scarier. Which leads us to a question. If we've been able to map so much of the universe and detect stars and astronomical events from billions of light years away, then how come we haven't found anyone else? Why haven't we seen any other life forms, despite the fact that any intelligent life that could exist has had much more time to prosper than we did? After all, the universe is 13.8 billion years old, and there are trillions of Earth-like planets within the habitable zones of their stars, so where are all the aliens? This realization and the question it asks is called the Fermi Paradox, and we don't have an answer to it. Maybe the universe we live in is so hostile to life that no other life forms formed except for us. Maybe the universe was never meant to harbor any life. Earth is the only place a human can survive unaided as far as we know. We can't breathe in space, nor can we breathe or live on any of the other planets that we find. This is mostly because we are what's known as a subtype 1 civilization. This way of classifying civilizations into types is called the Kardashev Scale, proposed by Nikolai Kardashev in 1964. It's a way of ranking civilizations based on how technologically advanced they are. A Type 1 civilization is capable of controlling the entire energy output of their own planet. A Type 2 civilization can control the energy output of their entire planetary system. 
A type 3 civilization can control the energy output of an entire galaxy, and type 4, multiple galaxies. We are currently at around 0.73 if you were wondering. If any type 3 or type 4 civilizations did exist, they would be like gods to us, but we would also most certainly notice them by now. But the reason that we haven't might be due to all of the things I've talked about in this video, from the expanse of space to the hostility of exoplanets. It can be hard for life to exist in such a hostile universe. So it could be the reason why we haven't seen any alien civilizations yet. If so, that's terrifying. The thought that not only is space a scary and mysterious place, but we're the only ones here to experience how scary and mysterious it all is, is, in my opinion, even worse than if we knew that there were others like us, experiencing the beauty and the horror of the cosmos. But it's even more scary knowing that no civilization can truly develop in a place like this without eventually dying out. Either we are alone in the emptiness of space, or we will never become a spacefaring civilization. Both options don't seem good for us. Despite my personal opinion being equivalent in importance to that of an IGN reviewer, I personally think that aliens do exist. If so, the fact that we don't know about any yet really puts the size of space into perspective. The fact that there is so much distance between us and a possible alien civilization truly shows the sheer size of space. Even with technologies that can look billions of years into the past at distant quasars and black holes, we still haven't found any other life. The universe's size holds us hostage and keeps us from finding anyone else. But it hasn't kept us from trying. Currently on the Voyager 1 spacecraft, there's a golden record. It contains information about humanity, just in case any alien civilization or even future humans ever found it. The record contains 116 images along with audio and video recordings of humans, music, and animals, and greetings in 55 different languages. The record itself is made of copper with a golden cover and some uranium-238 so that smart aliens can analyze the half-life of the uranium and figure out when the message was sent. On the cover are a couple of things. Instructions on how to play the record, along with a pulsar map that shows where Earth is, along with the hydrogen hyperfine transition unit definition, which is just a fancy way of trying to find common ground between distances, along with instructions on how to play the video portion of the record. Along with all of that is a recorded voice message from the then President of the United States, Jimmy Carter. This is what it says. This is a present from a small, distant world. A token of our sounds, our science, our images, our music, our thoughts, and our feelings. We are attempting to survive our time so we may live into yours. We hope someday, having solved the problems we face, to join a community of galactic civilizations. This record represents our hope and our determination and our goodwill in a vast and awesome universe. There is something eerie about the message. Just the concept of shooting something out into space with information about us as a species, having no clue where it ends up. It's kind of like the outer space equivalent of yelling, is anyone there in a dark forest? It's also a message with an unknown recipient. We have no clue what aliens look like, how they talk, if they're even based on the same molecules that we are. How do you find common ground with a life form far different from your own? Well, we tried our best to find that common ground. But then the scary question arises. What if we are sending the message to no one? What if there's no intelligent life to receive our message, not even in billions of years? Well, if that's the case, then Voyager 1 will travel alone, carrying some of the only evidence that humanity has ever existed into the cosmos only for nobody to ever find it. The record will exist for billions of years, with absolutely no one to listen to it. Outer space isn't just visually scary and a source of existential fear and dread, it's also an auditory wonder as well. I bet most of you have heard the term, in space, no one can hear you scream. This claim is telling the truth. Not only are you likely far away from civilization and people, but you quite literally cannot hear someone scream through the vacuum of space. It has no molecules for sound to travel through. Despite this, we still know what space sounds like. How? Well, space might not have any sound waves, but it does have other waves. We can then translate these other waves into sound waves and hear what different things in space sound like. 
and they are equally as terrifying as the visuals of space, if not more. We can hear what the planets of our solar system sound like, along with many other things, and they are chilling, to say the least. When the Cassini space probe paid a quick visit to Jupiter before it went to Saturn, it stayed just long enough to record a bit of Jupiter's sound, and it got this back from Jupiter. It bodes an uncanny resemblance to what birds sound like here on Earth, but something seems off about it, almost like Jupiter's pretending to sound like Earth, like a monster imitating the cries of a child to lure its victims. It's freaky knowing that no matter how scary the planets of our solar system look to us, they always sound just as scary. Then there are the sounds of moons. In 2021, a space probe was doing a mission around Jupiter and made a flyby by Ganymede, a moon of Jupiter, and recorded some audio of the moon. Pitched down to a level where humans can hear it, it sounds like this. It's chilling. It sounds almost like a distorted recording, but it isn't. That's just the sound that Ganymede makes. However, the sounds of space go beyond the solar system, and even beyond solid astronomical objects. A NASA space telescope named Chandra studied the Perseus Galaxy Cluster. It detected ripples through space, not much different from ripples in water. Scientists determined that these ripples were produced by a supermassive black hole. Whenever a black hole eats something, it spits some of that thing out. The thing being spit out pushes around nearby gases. Translating these gas ripples into sounds shows us what a black hole eating something sounds like. And it sounds like this. The original frequency of this black hole audio was low. Very low. To understand how low, let me put it into perspective. The recording of the black hole sound needed to be pitched up by 288 quadrillion times in order to be heard by humans. The sounds of space are both interesting to hear and interesting to gather, and to me, can be just as scary as the visual universe. I think that, despite the scariness of space, astrophobia is a bit of an irrational fear. There really isn't much of a threat present here on Earth, and even the cosmic events that can affect Earth are usually never brought up in discussions of astrophobia. Which is why I think media that explores astrophobia is important, because it actually gives you a reason to be scared of the universe, as you're actually partaking in it. The world of video games in particular can really trigger astrophobia, but even those don't scare me as much as VR space games. Games like No Man's Sky and Elite Dangerous are PC games at heart, but both have a VR port. I won't talk much about No Man's Sky because it's more of a caricature of space trying to be a fun game rather than a real simulation of what it would be like to explore the cosmos. Elite Dangerous, however, is the exact opposite of this. Especially in VR, it really provokes a real, accurate simulation of what exploring space would be like. And it is as awe-inspiring as it is terrifying. If you had a spaceship and could access the entire Milky Way galaxy, where would you go? It seems like an uncomplicated question, but not everyone can answer it. There's simply too much to explore and too much to see. Elite Dangerous gives you this experience. It's a space simulator type game that simulates flying a spaceship around the Milky Way. And by the Milky Way, I mean the entire Milky Way. The map is literally the size of a galaxy. It's insane. I love Elite Dangerous in VR. I wish I could say I love Just Elite Dangerous, but I really think this game is meant to be experienced in VR. On flat screen, it's a game about grinding for materials, getting into fights, and selling things. A true simulator game. But in VR, it's way more than that. It's an awe-inspiring yet terrifying example of the power of VR and the true terrifyingness of space. Every time I exit warp drive and see a star in front of me, or every time I explore the rings of a planet larger than I can imagine, I feel truly intimidated. If you have astrophobia, then I recommend this game? I don't know. It feels weird recommending a game like this to someone with astrophobia. It seems almost counterintuitive, but for me at least, the amazement and the wonder of space is enough to justify being jump scared by every star I visit. And it's only helped by it being in VR. 
Grindy tasks like mining asteroids turn into wondrous and awe-inspiring experiences. Traveling between planets in a system turns from a momentary boring detour to a pleasured experience that shows you the true scale of space and the fragility of humans inside of spaceships. Really, if you have a VR headset, I can't recommend Elite Dangerous enough. And if you have astrophobia, then the experience is weirdly more profound. In the vast expanse of the cosmos, we not only find profound objects and unsolved mysteries, but we find ourselves. A reflection of humanity that glistens from each star above. A reflection of our curiosity and our lust for the unknown. Astrophobia, to me at least, is not just the fear of space and celestial bodies, but the fear of the unknown. In the search for meaning in this universe, we've come across many other things that elude us. And we ask many questions. Why are we alone? Why is there something rather than nothing? Why is the universe built this way and not some other way? And maybe we'll never know the answer to these questions. Maybe they're meant to be left unanswered. I said earlier in the video that the fear of space is irrational, but I take that back. I think the fear of space is one of the most rational fears out there. From the visuals, to the sounds, the questions, and the concepts of our universe, astrophobia is a representation of what we as humans fear most. The important questions and the unknown. But now more than ever, we are forging a closer relationship with space. With independent companies making spacecrafts and landing on planets and plans to colonize Mars, astrophobia will most likely persist for generations to come. We might be scared of space, but we can't let that fear define our relationship with the universe. We should instead use our fears as a catalyst for exploration, a lens for which we explore the cosmos. And I feel that this image is one that describes our relationship with space well. Taken by the James Webb Space Telescope, it depicts what looks to be a cosmic question mark floating through space. Although it's probably a distant galaxy or something, our relationship with space can be perfectly summed up by it. A never-ending series of questions in an infinite and awesome universe. And I'd like to end this video with a quote from one of my personal heroes, the late Carl Sagan. Somewhere, something incredible is waiting to be known. It is our choice whether we approach that something incredible with fear or with the boundless curiosity that defines us as a species. The universe is waiting, and the stars are our guide. The final frontier beckons, and it is up to us to answer the call.